Um, so my name is Maria Gomez. I'm um, work at ThoughtWorks. I've been working at ThoughtWorks for the last uh, seven years. Um, currently, I play the role of head of technology for ThoughtWorks in Spain, in sunny Barcelona. Um, and I, as I say, I've been working for ThoughtWorks for seven years. Um, in the last four, four and a half, I've been uh, mainly working with organizations that are on a transformational journey, on a digital transformation journey. Um, so this talk will have a lot of the experience and learnings that I picked up along the way. Um, and um, I hope that what I'll say will resonate with uh, most of you, either because you have gone through similar experience or because you are in the middle of, of one of them. Uh, we're going to be... This, I don't know, can we be any close to the other microphone? So we're going to be splitting this talk in two parts. Uh, we are going to talk about using domain-driven design to help us understand better our system and to make better decisions when we want to uh, break it down into microservices. And then we are also going to link it to uh, you know, some of the operational concerns and observability concerns that you also need to bake in when you are uh, breaking down your monolith. Yeah? So, Let's start. Um, I guess this is uh, kind of the typical scenario. You have a monolith um, that is been working for many years, but is now you know showing its age and is slowing you down because it's not giving you the uh, delivery speed that you need or the business needs, and also it's very painful to work with. It's very uh, brittle and very fragile. So um, you know you think that uh, moving into the um, amazing world of microservices will help a lot of, uh, will help you solve a lot of those problems, right? It will help you create that independence that you need, and it will help you um, increase the velocity and the delivery lead time, that, or actually decrease that time, so going to production much faster. Um, but, you know, this is the dream, and it's a very naive scenario, because um, in reality things are, be, things are a bit more complicated. Um, normally, your system will look a lot like this. Um, you will have, um, sure, you have a monolith, but you have a tons of other stuff um, that is also interacting with that. Um, there will be a lot of history in this system. You might have, uh, you know, prior intents or attempts to break that down into different parts, and those attempts uh, might not have gone according to plan, and they were abandoned halfway through. Uh, you might have, you know, just um, integrations at various levels. For example, you might have, sorry, there you go. So you might have, you know, different databases that are being accessed uh, by different services, and, you know, even the hard job that's uh, synchronized to databases. You will have services that are very chatty, so they are mixing or sending and receiving a lot of information among each other. Um, all of these things are... Um, a symptom. They are a symptom of, um, you know, taking decisions that um, some of those cases were purely technical and didn't take into consideration the business. And the result of that is that you end up with a set of services uh, that might not have the right boundaries, uh, because those boundaries were not set by, by the business or didn't have any, any business capabilities in mind. Um, and that's what I experience in a lot of the organizations that I work with. Um, and what I do with those teams and what I do with those organizations is I help them take a step back and start looking at what are the business capabilities, what is that business domain, and how can we uh, start modeling our services around those capabilities. Um, so domain-driven design um, allows you to think um, around those terms and to help you um, fix that root problem that you have. Um, so, so yeah, so then you can end up uh, identifying all of those subdomains and then extract them into uh, better form services. Um, how? Well, I'm um, going to go very quickly to just give you a definition of what domain-driven design, design is and how it can help you. So domain-driven design is just an approach to build software uh, that has complex and ever-changing business requirements. Um, and I guess most of us are in that situation. We, as an organization, we have a very complex business, and we want to evolve it, evolve it to, to be even more complex. 
Um, there are multiple books in the subject. Some of them are more theoretical than others, um, regardless of what your choice is. Um, the truth is that there is a lot of literature that you can go and read to learn more about domain-driven design if uh, you haven't done so. Um, and it's the thing that ultimately is gaining a lot of traction also. Um, I'm just gonna go through a very, a couple of very key concepts. Um, so the main domain side talks about the concept of a domain. A domain is uh, basically the activity that an organization does, where does it does um, its work. So, you know, finance, health, um, retail, things like that. Um, what are some domains are abstractions that describe a select aspect of that domain. So if you're in the finance, a subdomain could be payments, um, statements, credit card applications, etc. cetera. Um, a ubiquitous language, which is a word that I cannot pronounce, um, is the language that we use to talk about uh, things that happen in that subdomain. And uh, bounded context is the explicit boundaries uh, within the um, boundaries within which a subdomain exists, and is where we also use that, that language that we created. Um, if we kind of try to illustrate all those concepts, still in a very theoretical way, um, we can use this image from uh, the Marty Fowler blog, uh, blog. Basically, you might say I'm working in the e-commerce uh, domain, and within that I have two subdomains, the sales and the support. Um, so the mains, I also have defined the bounded context, so that's where the sales domains finish and the support uh, context starts. Um, and I also define certain entities um, that will um, give me um, you know, the functionality that I need. Note that in both of them, I have the concept of customer and products, but they will mean different things in each one of those domains. And customer in sales will care maybe about financial information or payment information, and, and it will have actions that are related to that, whereas in support, it will be something completely different. Um, so the language and the meaning of all of those entities will be different in each one of of the other domains. Um, so now the power of domain-driven design is that it allows you to draw all of these boundaries, all of these lines, and you can create a specialis a specialization within them. So you can start creating product teams that specialize in each one of those subdomains. Right? So you can have a sales team that has product people and technical people that are solely working on evolving that domain. Um, and therefore, you can start achieving that autonomy that you need, um, not just in the technical sense, but also in the business or the organizational sense. If we kind of move it to, we bring it back to a bit more of uh, implementation details, uh, we go back to our monolith, we can use domain-driven design to identify the subdomains that we have within the model, monolith, uh, draw those boundaries, um, focus on isolate them within the monolith. It's very important. You should not split things before you have removed all the dependencies uh, through very clean APIs in the place where they are. Um, and once you have done that, you can then extract them into different microservices at the same time as you are also reducing the complexity of that monolith where they no longer live. Um, so, there are many ways of going about this process because it's a very complex process. I'm going to show you uh, one exercise that I've done in many places that has helped teams to understand a bit better how to go about identifying those domains. Um, regardless of um, the tool that you use to um, kind of identify those things, it's very important that you bring into those um, talks, people from the different disciplines that you have in your organization or that are interested on, on this domain. So developers, uh, obviously, but also product owners, subject matter experts, infrastructure people, etc., etc. So, um, so the um, tool that I use a lot is event storming. Uh, how many of you know about event storming? Okay. So a fair amount of you. Okay, so event storming is just a um, workshop format um, that allows you to quickly explore complex business domains, right? Um, so 
It was created by Alberto Brandolini, so I haven't created this thing. Um, I just use it quite a lot. And the basic idea is that it allows you to bring uh, software developers and domain experts together and, and learn from each other. Uh, you're using the stickies and a wall to make the whole thing much more interactive and engaging. Um, there are various concepts that they are using this type of exercise that are also in line with the domain driven design concepts, so it's all kind of nicely put together. Um, a domain event is something that has happened, um, and is of interest on a, of a domain expert. A command is an external instruction to do something, uh, so what triggers that domain event. And an aggregate is the portion of the system that receives the commands and then decides whether it needs to trigger that event um, as a reaction from that command. So, you know, if we are in the retail uh, or in the e-commerce space, um, an event could be that an item has been added to the basket. Um, a command can be, you know, user press buy or something like that. Um, and the aggregate could be the basket itself. Right. So um, let's look at an example and think of how this workshop will go um, and how will it work. So um, let's imagine we are, in a, we are building or we have a cinema website in which we can go and buy tickets. You know, people go and buy their Avengers Endgame tickets in there. Um, and, and what we are doing is getting people from all of these different disciplines and we say, hey, we need to map that process. Uh, we have the starting event, so where people enter the site, and we have the ending event, so where uh, the customer will finish with that flow. Um, and the goal of this workshop is to just fill the gaps, right? Um, so the process will start at either side of the flow, I guess, uh, or in the middle. But the, the idea is that you start filling it with all the events of all of those things that will happen in between. So, you know, the show is selected, and the set, the seats um, are reserved, um, the ticket is added to the card, and so on and so forth until we get to uh, the email that is sent with the ticket confirmation. Then we look into what are the commands that are triggering those events. And as you can see, we are not going into technical stuff. Here we are purely talking about business. Um, so what are the commands that will trigger all of these events? Once we have that, we can start saying, okay, so what are the aggregates? What are the entities that we think can, uh, you know, handle these commands? And then we start like having a discussion and looking about them um, and talking about them. So we can say, you know, this area over here looks like a buyer is the one that is, you know, reacting uh, through all, reacting um, against those commands and taking the necessary actions. Whereas over here we see more the figure of an accountant, uh, on the other, other, at the end we see a customer service. Um, so then we start drawing those lines, and those lines is the one that will uh, kind of tell us where our boundaries or our bounded context uh, will lie. And obviously, you know, the first time you do it, uh, you might not be super sentient about those lines, and that's fine. This is, you know, an iterative process that you will need to repeat a few times uh, over, um, you know, many months to, to make sure that you are going in the right direction. Um, if we go to another example, and this is something that I've done quite recently in one of the projects that, I involve, that I'm involved in, um, this is a retail, a fast fashion a retailer in Spain, and they are exactly on a transformational journey, so they have a um, set of legacy systems and they want to uh, you know, update them and evolve them into microservices, right? Um, so the team that I was working on kind of owns the checkout domain, which is massive, uh, and it's also all within this very big and very complex monolith. So we were trying to identify what possible source domains we could um, see within that domain and start to split them into different services. So this is a very, um, you know, simple flow of what a checkout might look like. Uh, obviously the one that we use it was a bit more complicated, but for the sake of this example, I just used a reduced one. Um, and again, we started with like, um, when the user press the basket button, that's when they take out the star, and it just start with the first event, which is the order, an order gets created. Up until then, it was like a basket, and now it's, it's an order. 
um, and at the end of the checkout process, the confirmation is sent by email. And we did the similar thing. We found all of the events. We also found all of the commands and identified them, all of the commands, uh, the aggregates that were um, managing all of the commands, and we also start drawing the lines. So obviously, here we got a bit more uh, stuff going on. Uh, again, our lines were a bit fuzzy, uh, but as I say, we kept repeating this process uh, um, over a long period of time, and we are still repeating it every so often to make sure that we are still what we think those boundaries will be, or we are changing them as we know more. Um, so now that you have identified all of these boundaries, you can, you know, just start with the nicer stuff, right? So you can start isolating those concepts, those contexts, uh, so then they can be extracted into services. So, um, and I'm going to be repeating this a lot, um, it's very important that you isolate them within the monolith. Um, so no database integration, no coupling with other subdomains. Um, you should be having a very nice package or uh, something that is independent, that has a nice and clean API uh, that the rest of the system can interrupt with uh, and that that thing is very, um, very well put together, right? So um, uh, this is not a shift and lift. Uh, you will need to do a lot of refactoring to get to the point. So this is not going to be easy. Um, but once you have done that, it's going to be much easier to then just break it down and create a new artifact out of that. Uh, because boundary contexts uh, have many attributes. Um, and three, of them that, uh, three of them are that is a high cohesive and loosely coupled um, context and that it represents a business capability. So. Um, payments, statements, as we said before. Um, and if we added other stuff, like independence in terms of the technical of the tech stack, um, independence in terms of deployment, if we isolate the failures and we um, scale it in an individual and independent way, um, guess what? We have a microservice. Um, so, you know, it's very important that defining uh, our well um, well-defined in the context will give us a uh, halfway through getting a very well-defined microservice. So, uh, what's next? Um, if we go back to this retail example, right? Um, we say that we have identified many business, con many bounded contexts. Uh, so we have promotions there, orders, uh, payments, um, delivery. So, you know, we can't tackle them all at once. That's not going to be very fun and it's going to take us a long time until we see any results. Uh, so we need to pick one. How can we pick one? Well, in uh, this case, um, we knew that um, as a business, as, as the product of all, wanted to um, start exploring and experimenting with new ways of uh, offering uh, delivery services to the users. Um, and just improving the service that they were and the experience that they were having uh, currently. So delivery uh, seemed to us like a nice um, little um, place where we could start extracting that context and that functionality. Uh, but there are many dimensions uh, to decide where to start. Uh, in our case, we use pace of chain as uh, the, the biggest one because we wanted to create a place that would allow us to chain and experiment very quickly. But in other cases, you might think that performance is a, is a better indicator or a higher priority. You feel like there is um, a place in your monolith that might be uh, using a lot of resources and therefore making the whole monolith using a lot of resources and that it might be better off if you split it into something um, isolated or independent. Um, whatever it is, is that you decide is your driver, uh, make sure that you are able to articulate what's the business value that is giving you. Uh, and you should have a pretty good idea by now because you have done a lot of conversations with the business. Um, so definitely we need to be able to say we want to extract these uh, microservices, we want to do this as part of this business initiative and not as a one-off thing uh, completely separate from, from the business. Um, doing things like this for um, the sake of tech is not, um, doesn't make a lot of sense. 
we should be able to say we're doing this because it's going to provide us this value. It's going to give us uh, that platform for experimentation that we are looking for. It's going to let us save some operation, operational costs because we're going to be able to optimize and the resources that we use, whatever it is, but having that conversation with the business um, is what is, I think, key to, to make one of these transformations successful. So, now uh, we have a framework that helps us to identify subdomains and extract them into microservices. Um, so our job is done, right? Now we just need to go and start extracting them away. Um, well, not. Uh, that's not. Uh, we're not done. We are actually just um, scratching the surface of, of, you know, what all of this means. Um, we have identified what we want to extract. We now have a lot of um, domain knowledge that is going to help us to identify other things that lie b below the surface, uh, because there are many. Um, Con other concerns that we need to take care of uh, that are easily overlooked. Um, and these are the areas that people get wrong time and time again, and this is how we end up with complex systems that um, you know, are difficult to maintain and difficult to uh, support in production. Because uh, microservices, like any other distributed architecture, might make uh, our code simpler and easier but it's not, it's not making our, com our system any less complex. It's just moving that complexity to another place. Um, so yeah, so testing, deployment, security, operations, they just a few of the other concerns that you need to uh, take into consideration when you are going through this journey. Um, and actually, I think we have seen a lot of the, this concern being discussed over the day, uh, over the morning today, and we are going to see some of them also this afternoon. So, you know, it's a very important thing to take into consideration. Um, you have an advantage, is that, that you have been applying domain-driven design, so uh, you now have a better understanding of what the business wants and how uh, to prioritize that. Um, and also, um, you know, just having a better idea of how you can tackle all of these concerns and how you can measure that they are actually giving you the value that you need. Um, so for the rest of the talk, we are not going to focus in all of them. We're just going to choose one. We're going to be focused on operations and um, explicitly or, imp or specifically on observability, which is, um, which is the availability of interrogate your system and get uh, accurate answers uh, that improve your understanding of it. Um, it encompasses any question that you might want to ask your system, and those questions are not limited to errors or anomalies. It can be uh, around anything. Um, so um, why is that important? Uh, well, because our systems are increasingly complex, uh, so it's not enough to react gracefully to errors. It's not enough to um, look at a snapshot of uh, the state of our system. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it is very important that we can um, that we can understand and ask questions to our services that give us insight into what they are up to. Um, and when we start creating new services, we should take um, observability as a first-class citizen, and we should start baking in some of the um, some of the. Um, techniques and attributes that will make our microservices observable. Um, so, what does that mean? What does it mean that a um, microservice is observable? Well, that means that you have to have a strategy, a clear strategy on how you're going to go about logging, uh, monitoring, alerting, and tracing. Uh, because none of these things will be the same as what you were using when you were having uh, a monolith. Um, excuse me. And um, we are going to go through um, each one of these, uh, and we are going to talk about them in a, li in a little more uh, of details. So let's start by logging. Um, logging is uh, your building block for everything else. 
um, and you know what you were doing up until now might or might not be the right thing to do. Definitely, you were accessing the production box and um, copying application.log and then open it in a text editor. That's not the right thing to do, and that's also not something that is going to scale when you have 10 or hundreds of services. Um, and it also, you were not um, thinking about the formats of what you were logging or what you're logging then also another thing that is not going to scale. So what can you do about that? Well, the first thing that you can do is to start looking at how you can implement something called the log aggregation pattern, which should be pretty standard by now. Um, you don't need to have a microservice to implement this pattern. Um, actually, one of the boxes on the, on the left will, probab will probably uh, be your monolith. Uh, so the local aggregation pattern talk about how you know you have different um, services that have different text stack, and that they are going to be writing logs. Um, but you want something that collects those logs, transform them into a structure that can be easily consumed by other systems um, downstream. Uh, those can be your monitoring tool. That can be a, visual, a log visualization tool where you can query uh, all of those logs. Uh, but that's kind of the idea here. Um, you should, we should set up um, our new services in a way that they can log um, in a way that they can log uh, that, that the log can be collected. Um, and you should also be thinking about building this infrastructure if you don't have if you don't have it uh, already in place. And that's something that should happen when you start extracting your first microservice. It's not it shouldn't happen as an afterthought um, in a month or in a few months' time. Um, I don't know how uh, many of you are um, familiar with the Elk stack, but this is, you know, like very standard way of implementing this um, this pattern. There are other ones you can use Splunk, for example, some other ones. Um, the library that each one of the microservices use to implement or to, um, you know, write logs is really not the most important thing, but what is important is what they log and what is the structure of that. Because uh, you're going to have a number of different microservices. If they don't share the same structure, then it's going to be very difficult for um, anyone to try to effectively query uh, and use that visualization tool. Um, so, you know, make sure that you have some kind of a standard and that say we are going to be logging uh, in JSON. These are the um, key value pairs that are going to be mandatory for all the logs, and then you can uh, start putting the ones that are more specific for your service after that. After that. Uh, but, you know, you can specify what are the ones that then uh, you want always, so then you can index them uh, when they are in whatever data storage that you decide to put them. Um, and, you know, as with any of the things that we have said, um, you probably won't get it right the first time, so just start iterating that you see that, uh, that you are learning more about your systems or your services. Um, the second thing is monitoring. Monitoring uh, has a goal, and that goal is uh, to have enough information to help you make decisions. Um, that information could be, you know, you can make decisions related to technology, so technical decisions or operational decisions. You can also make business decisions with this information. Doesn't matter, but it's important that you have a centralized place to see all of that. Um, you want to see trends. You want to see, observe the system over time uh, and confer your hypothesis. Um, when a new functionality or a new microservice comes um, online or in production, you want to see and understand what is the effect that it has in the whole system. Um, probably the tool that you're using for querying your um, for going your logs has dashboard capabilities, and you don't need to go anything. Uh, you don't need to go to something very, uh, you know, sophisticated. You can start from something very simple and then keep evolving. And, and if you feel that that tool is not giving you the requirements anymore, you can upgrade it to something different. Um, so if I go back to the example of the um, retailer, we did, um, as I say, we start extracting the delivery service. So for us, 
you know, looking at how that service was behaving was really important. So we start monitoring certain metrics in there. Our data points were response times and things like that. Um, and then also we started to um, understand that this had also had an impact on the business. Uh, you know, after all the conversations that we have over the process, we had a better uh, understanding of what the impact that might be, and we wanted to test out our hypothesis. So our hypothesis was that replacing and extracting that monolith, uh, sorry, that microservice, will not affect sales. So the way that we uh, test that out was by um, doing something called semantic monitoring, in which we automated certain flows, um, and we run them in production. Uh, and we run them constantly. That's not uh, a one-off thing. We just run them constantly, and we grab that data and plot it in our monitoring tool. So now we can see uh, not only how every single chain affects our service, but also how it affects the whole um, customer journey. Um, as I mentioned before, it's very important that all of this is in one centralized place, and that can be accessible by everyone in the teams. So um, these dashboards and those uh, metrics that you monitor are not just a thing that are interested uh, or interesting by or for the operational team or the business people. This will be something interesting for um, everyone. Um, and as I also mentioned, you can use many tools for doing that. Um, Kibana is a very simple option. It gives you very nice uh, visualization and dashboard capabilities. Um, and as I say, you're using Kibana for login aggregation. You might as well also use it for this. Uh, but you can go for something a bit more complex like Prometheus or Datadog that can also give you um, very nice functionalities. Regardless of what you use, uh, be careful not to add too much stuff. You might end up on uh, just getting a lot of noise that is not helping you. Uh, you have a lot of things uh, in there. You it might be as useful and not have, uh, not have any, because uh, everything is just lost in, uh, with all of the noise. Um, so the way that you can do that is just by keep reviewing what you're monitoring, keep reviewing those metrics, and uh, consistently remove the ones that are not um, of interest for you anymore. Um, you know, if they become interesting again, you can put them back. Um, but you know, just remove them um, if you don't use them. Um, alerting um, is the next topic. So um, alerts are just things that need uh, immediate reaction. Um, and alerts, um, you know, are very important that they have an action because uh, your alerts, uh, so the alerts will be triggered by a service, but then the person who is reacting to that alert will probably be someone who hasn't uh, built a service or doesn't own the service. So it's very important that your alerts are actually telling what are the actions or what are the things that can be done to close them. Um, so, yeah, so you can also start looking at the standardization in these states. So what are the important things that an alert can have and how all of your services um, and all of your microservices could be adopting these templates. Um, another thing is that not all alerts need a human interaction. Um, not every single thing that happened to a service needs someone to press a button at 3 a.m. Um, and you should be actually aiming for having most of your alerts be resolved uh, in an, um, through automation. A very good example of this is auto-scaling. If you're using a cloud provider for your infrastructure, you get auto-scaling uh, more or less for free. Um, so make use of that, right? Um, there's no point of getting someone involved when, uh, when a process can actually be implemented that will resolve that. Um, Kibana also has some alerting functionality. You can define them, uh, Prometheus as well, and Opsgini is another tool that I have used uh, quite nicely um, to, to set up all of those alerts. Um, and last but not least, um, we should also be looking at tracing. Uh, tracing is going to be definitely useful for debugging. Um, you will, at some point in the near future, uh, we need to look at uh, production errors or just look at, you know, find, trying to find some bottlenecks in your system 
uh, or whatever that is. And that's going to be different to what you were doing in a monolith. Um, so, you know, you should be able to um, start thinking about how you're going to solve uh, that tracing problem. Um, why is it super important? Well, it's super important because you're going to be um, having a request that will uh, travel through your system, going or jumping from service to service, from microservice to microservice. Um, and in some cases, that communication might be asynchronous, or in some other cases, synchronous, whatever that is. But it's going to be very difficult to uh, try to trust, trace all of that. Um, when everything was in a monolith, it was everything in a single transaction, probably, so it was much easier to do that. So um, the first thing that you should be doing is to um, add just a trace ID or a correlation ID to every request that enters your system. Um, most of the frameworks that you will use to build your microservices will have a capability to add that trace ID. Um, so that should be easy enough. Um, and then if a problem or you need to go and debug something in production, you can just go to your login uh, tool and login visualization tool and then go and search by that trace ID and that will give you a picture of uh, all the places that that uh, request uh, went through. Um, you can then start putting that jigsaw, that puzzle together, because you will have all of those uh, pieces. They might be even out of order, so you uh, will need to go and work on getting uh, all of that sorted uh, and get the information that you need. Um, this, this type of work might be a bit tedious, and it might require a lot of knowledge of the system as a whole and different microservices. Um, so this might not be enough for you. You might want to start looking at a tool that allows you to put that picture in a more, uh, in a simpler way or an easier way. Um, and that's when you can use um, something like distributed tracing, uh, which are you know tools that will allow you to not just attach that um, trace ID to the request, but also send the information to a centralized place. Uh, that, allow, that will allow you to paint that picture for you. So you will have the image of where uh, your um, request went through, and it will also give you a lot more details than the one that you can, you can possibly have doing it by hand. Um, again, it doesn't really matter what uh, the service is used for implement this, uh, these distributed tracing uh, capabilities. There are many libraries that you can use. Um, where it's important, though, is to standardize on the formats um, that they're going to be using. Open tracing seems to be um, the better choice, so the best choice right now. Um, and you know, most of the tools that you will use to them visualize and manage all of that stuff, like Zipkin, um, Datadog, Dynatrace, um, they are all um, accepting open trace as a, as a format. So, uh, we have reached the end. Um, the takeaways, there are a few of them. Um, I think I pack a lot of stuff in the presentation, so there are a lot of things that you can, like how you can take away from, from, from it. Uh, microservices is really not a freelance. There are many things that you need to consider. Um, the most important one of them is that uh, we need to pay attention on what um, the value, the business values that we can provide and how we can um, align our technical interest with those business interests um, and create win-win situations. Um, so, you know, prioritize based on that business value. Uh, also, don't wait until you have everything clear and sorted. Um, start, you know, with what you know and keep evolving as you know more. Um, and also make sure that you include operational concerns and that you take advantage of all the knowledge that you have acquired by using uh, domain-driven design and by um, running event storming workshops um, to then identify, uh, you know, what logging, alerting, monitoring, and tracing needs to happen um, on your new microservices. And with that, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.